All right, so I start recording. Um, so welcome again. This is our second class. And uh, we'll pretty much um, continue from the point, or take off from the point we um, stopped the presentation last week, which was covering uh, the slides. Uh, and again, I put a link here. You can find the slides here. And also there is uh, the original link on the readings material. So if we go there, uh, you can find the slides both uh, as PowerPoint and uh, PDFs. Uh, so last uh, last week we were going to the basics of uh, music and audio representation. So I'll just continue from the point where we stopped uh, last week. Yes. All right, so um, so in terms of music and audio representation, you know, kind of quickly uh, mentioned the three types of uh, storing or representing or recording uh, musical data as a score, as performance actions, and as an actual recording of the audio for audio waveform. So from symbolic to uh, audio, and I, I can just like quickly uh, scroll through the slides. We spoke about you know, frequencies and notes and how they're related in terms of uh, hertz in the physical domain uh, and the pitches in basically the, the numbers that we are uh, using um, for the keys on the keyboard. And the equation that uh, we would also uh, need to implement in the homework. So, um, so the idea of having a sound, um, a periodic sound or periodic waveform, basically something that repeats itself. And we kind of assume that it repeats itself uh, pretty much exactly. That's what makes it periodic. So a sound like this can be decomposed into sine waves that have very particular relations between their frequency. And a sine wave is kind of the basic component of uh, an audio signal that we also call it a pure tone. So each period of a sine wave is kind of a particular frequency and that frequency corresponds to a peak. If we do analysis uh, of frequencies using techniques that we will not cover in this uh, uh, class so much, but just to be familiar with the notions. So there is the Fourier analysis of past Fourier transform if you want the specific implementation of the Fourier transform that takes a signal and breaks it down into its constituents, which are the frequencies. So if this is the complex waveform and we zoom in into a small segment and that segment is approximately periodic. And you can see that the actual waveform of a musical note is not exactly periodic. You know, it, of course, it didn't exist before the onset. Uh, it doesn't exist after the decay. And even during the life cycle of a note, it changes. So definitely it's not exactly periodic, but every short segment is approximately periodic. So we actually have to extract it. Um, a small chunk, sorry, in that chunk, uh, we can analyze for the frequencies. And these frequencies, uh, more or less, they constant, but they decay in amplitude, and maybe the relations between them change. So even that kind of almost ideal tone is not exactly a set of fixed frequencies, but for the purpose of our discussion here, we'll assume that basically we have this waveform that lasts for as long as the note is played, okay? And this kind of overall behavior in, in terms of amplitude over time is sometimes called you know, the envelope. And this is the temporal envelope. So it has an attack and has some kind of decay. Sometimes it has like a longer constant period, which is a sustain. Uh, so, uh, so ADSR uh, attack, uh, sus yeah, decay, sustain, and then there is a release. Okay, that's usually the envelope. If somebody wants to apply kind of a, um, a, a piecewise shape to describe the change of amplitude, but we would assume that we can ignore that for the purpose of our discussion and the frequency itself doesn't change. Or oh, the frequency components um, 
So yeah, so different notes. Each note has its own kind of shape. You can see that they do slightly the amplitudes of the different harmonics. So each one is a sine solo component, does vary over time, but you know, we'll assume that this is pretty much a constant uh, template or like a comp, comp. Sometimes people call this a comp filter because this looks like a comp. They're equally spaced and these are the different pitches, the lower partial and the rest are the other partials. So the fundamental and the other harmonics or partials that's what comprises of the tone itself. And this is what makes it a complex tone rather than an ideal sinusoid that will have only one line. So uh, I'm kind of going quickly through that because uh, this is just to set the basic terms uh, that will lead us to the next discussion pretty soon. So here again, the three representations, the waveform, the piano roll, and the frequency representation, which is analysis of a short segment of the waveform. And, uh, and that's how you know, the frequency over time, so-called the spectrogram, uh, relates to the piano roll. So the actual pitches are just a lower portion of the, of the spectrogram. The rest is occupied with the harmonics and whatever effects we have uh, because of the room, the reverb, and of course the timbre, which is all these other harmonics. So that's where we ended last week. And now we'd like kind of to look a little bit more into the specifics of the structure that uh, notes, uh, both in terms of you know the organization of notes, the choice of keys, right? We have these 12 notes, or uh, we have octaves, which means like these patterns of 12 keys repeat themselves actually 11 keys that then repeat again. We have the white and the black ones. And, um, and there is this sense of uh, symmetry or equivalence between notes that are an octave apart. Okay, we kind of feel that it's the same pitch, but it sounds higher. So to accommodate or represent this effect of kind of the tone color that changes but the tone height the jumps octaves, uh, um, people are proposing or using so-called this chroma representation uh, that separates the notes themselves, the names of the notes. And we use uh, this letter notation. So going from C to C sharp to D, so C, okay? These gray ones are marked as Cs and C sharp is one step up and then D and D sharp and E. So I'm kind of going around the circle here. And as we move an octave up, the idea is that actually we move, you know, this in this case counterclockwise on the names of the notes, but we also go up in terms of the octaves. Okay, that's the tone height. So, and this is kind of an idea that kind of the sound on different octaves sounds the same, but still higher. So it falls on the same note, um, creates this kind of a spiral thing that we call a, a chromogram or a chroma representation. And um, it's expressed mathematically as this kind of a relation. So we, we think about the frequency of the note, okay? As something that uh, is a function of the, of the height and of the chroma, okay? Now, if you think about chroma instead of the circle as something that goes from zero to one, okay? And height are the octaves, which are fixed numbers, okay? So that's basically our attempt to translate a frequency, which is a physical phenomena of, you know, how, how many times or how fast the waveform repeats itself to these two numbers, okay? And we choose base of two, Okay, so you can kind of go back and translate because this is a real number. This is why we take you know, the integer, the lowest integer of this log two. And this is basically kind of an equation, you can say, that uh, we call chroma. And that uh, relates uh, the frequency to, um, to the chroma number. Uh, and that chroma number, um, is always kind of compensated or subtracted from the actual integer that represents the octave. 
uh, you have to work out, you know, try out this math to see that it makes sense. But basically what it does, it assigns numbers, again, we said from zero to one, that repeat themselves, okay, over octaves. Uh, and in, in that case, every number that uh, relates, let's say, to middle C will be um, uh, independent of the octave representation. So another way to think about this it, it, uh, in, you know, in musicological terms, sometimes called pitch class. So you basically condense all of the different octaves into one octave. Now, why we want to do that? Because then if we look at the actual frequency content of, of a, a musical tone, and you can see all these different peaks, okay? Uh, what we do is we kind of open up a, a window in frequency around every note that belongs to the same pitch class, and we sum them up, okay? And then we'll have the same red filter shifted, let's say to be the C sharp or being the D, and we sum up all of the energies spaced octaves, which basically doubling the frequencies with a specific width. And that ends up in summing them up, you have another cumulative energy. And uh, this way we take the whole frequency range and we condense it into 12 bins. So this is kind of the chroma representation that kind of summarizes and averages the notes into, into these chroma bins. It's kind of related to the constant Q transform that you were doing in the homework, only that the Q, you know, constant Q transform doesn't sum them together into 12 bins. It's actually kind of spaces frequencies to summarize or sum the energy into bins that correspond to the notes. And here we do this extra step and we take every uh, 12 steps and we add them together. So um, the idea is that now, instead of looking into a representation that is frequencies over time, where the frequencies are actually real numbers, the, 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 the hertz, which is what we saw here, right? This is the frequency in the hertz versus time. Of course, we kind of take a chunk of this, okay? And we summarize. So, so we don't take the whole spectrum, and add it into chroma, we take every slice of the spectrum here and we kind of squeeze it into 12 bits. Now, uh, this 12 bin representation, in some sense, uh, starts revealing, I wouldn't say it's one to one, there's an extra step of kind of trying to clean this thing up, but it kind of shows what notes have most energies. And in this example, and that's given from, you know, it's taken from, you know, an old PhD thesis uh, where this chroma was used to, uh, as a first step, we try to extract chords. So here we now have to um, explain or make more explicit, you know, a musical concept, which is uh, musical chords. So what are chords? Um, these are basically collections of notes that play together. And from all possible uh, combination of these notes, we usually focus only on, on the subset, a small subset of these possible notes. Uh, and we'll talk about what are the typical combinations of notes that come together into chords. For those of you who have a uh, musical background, some experience, uh, you probably you know, have heard about triads, uh, which are only three notes. And then you can have major, minor, uh, diminished, and so on. And basically, these are kind of three uh, basic triads. But then you can add more notes to these triads. That's where you get the seven chords, this number seven, and so on. And then, of course, you can also double the same notes. You can play or you know perform uh, the same note over different octaves. That's why you can have redundancy in terms of uh, the same pitch class appearing more than once. And then if you look at the frequencies that each note creates and you sum them together, you get these templates. And at least visually, um, kind of the, the claim here is that uh, this is a good approximation, a good first step to try to look at how are the energies distributed, okay? And uh, from these energies, basically you can deduce 
the musical notes. So here, now you have 12 pins. These pins correspond to the notes, the pitch classes, um, which are, um, as I said, they're invariant to the octave. You don't really care what octave is being played because you summed all the energies. So in, in this case, if we have this D minor seven, okay, which will be a chord that has the notes D, F, A, and the seventh will be a C, okay? So if you look at where are the strong energies, uh, we can see that D is the strongest one. In this case, the white is the strongest one. So we, we, we see that probably D appears a lot. There's a lot of energy in D. There's another D here, okay? But then if you look at the other ones, uh, you uh, should see like an F, this is E, and this is the next one, which will be, uh, well, there's E and F, just one half step. There is no sharp in the E. Uh, again, it might be a little fast for people who are less familiar with musical theory. If this is uh, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, and F. So between E and F, there is no black key. So that's half step. So this is F, okay? So D, F, A, and then C. You can see that basically kind of with maybe some kind of a simple thresholding, you extract the actual notes. Maybe you don't distinguish between these double Ds. You don't know exactly the voicing. You don't know how the notes are spread, but you can see which notes comprise the dominant uh, or what energies comprise the, you know, the dominant notes in this chord. And this is kind of the first approximation, first step to try to map frequencies, okay, into 12 bins from which you basically extract the chords. Not maybe, not a very sophisticated way of uh, chord extraction or transcription of, of, of chords from, uh, from actual recording. Um, if you want to do this in a way that is very robust to different instruments and voicings, today you would use you know, neural networks and stuff to actually learn these patterns in very adaptive ways. But that's kind of the whole idea that, you know, the, the, the red and the white ones kind of capture the actual notes being played. Okay, so this is a feature which is called the chromograph. Another audio feature, uh, again, we will deal less with these types of features in, you know, in next classes, but it's still something that some of the packages that we're using uh, implement and they're very powerful for uh, tasks such as music information retrieval, matching timbres. These are called MEL frequency capsule coefficients, okay? And what they do, uh, they basically, again, take the original Fourier analysis, they take the original decomposition of a signal into frequencies, okay? So again, we look into only one, uh, one um, slice or one bin here which means like only one FFT, okay? Uh, so if we took a look at these as columns, so we take like one slice, one window, and instead of looking linear in frequency, uh, we average this in a slightly different way, not by opening, let's say, windows over positioning of nodes. You open windows which correspond to the width of our um, Kind of auditory filters. Okay, so this is so called MEL scale. Okay, and, and if you think about this as filters, you call it MEL scale filter bank. And it represents kind of the sensitivity of uh, our um, hearing apparatus or the cochlea, okay, to changes in frequencies. In some sense, there is every region, and I didn't talk about physiology of, uh, you know, the the inner ear and how it actually does something which is like a frequency uh, analysis, but instead of doing FFT or linear decomposition, it does this kind of representation. So what happens, it's more sensitive, you know, to frequencies in the lower frequency scale. And then after hitting some threshold here, okay, you can see that around thousand Hertz, now this is logarithmic scale, you start having filters that become wider and wider and wider, okay? So what we have is um, like high frequency resolution for the lower frequencies. And above that, we kind of like 
are not as sensitive. You can have blur or average frequencies in wider and wider filters as we go higher in frequency. So this kind of represents our frequency sensitivity over different frequency ranges. Uh, now, this is the MEL frequency filter bank, okay? Uh, and very often we do this extra step, which is called capsule coefficients, which is a, a, a technical, you would say trick, but it has also some very nice properties that takes this MEL frequency, okay? It translates this using a log and then another consign transform into a set of coefficients. Now, uh, why we do that, um, it's, it's, it's outside of the scope of this uh, class kind of to go into what MFCC, what the capsule coefficients mean, but um, kind of the overall motivation is that many times, you know, we, we want to separate some aspects of the signal, let's say the fast aspects of, oh, sorry, you know, maybe the, the shape, the waveform itself, and the ask, so they're kind of like the detailed fluctuations of what comprises a waveform versus uh, the long-term repetitions. So if you look at this waveform, right, uh, there are these fast variations here and there's this long-term repetition, which is related to the pitch. Uh, so one way of doing this is doing this capsule coefficient trick. And then uh, without any proof, you know, what I would like just to mention is that by doing this, if you look at the lower capsule coefficients, it kind of represents the shape of the waveform, which means kind of the color itself. And then the higher coefficients actually start showing peaks that depend on the pitch, on the long-term repetition. And many times, if we want just to be thinking about the timbre or how it sounds, and we don't care about the pitch, um, so the easiest example would be, let's say you want to recognize a vowel, okay, ah, and you don't care if I'm saying ah or ah, 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 I mean, I changed the pitch, but I'm still saying the same thing versus oh, 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 To capture that aspect of what is the timbre itself, the color, independently, separately from pitch, this capsule trick, just by looking at the lower capsule coefficients allows us to kind of cut away from, uh, uh, pitch related aspects of the signal. I know that it might not mean much to you right now, but this is kind of a very common representation. And very often for purposes of like matching timbres, matching musical instruments, kind of the color of the musical instrument, recognizing say the violin versus trumpet, regardless of what pitch they're playing, people use MFCCs and they just take the lower MFCC coefficients. So that was kind of the signal processing aspect. And one more thing that I'll talk more today in the class is this so-called Tonnet's representation. So uh, in some sense, we, we kind of uh, uh, devoted maybe a little time to, uh, maybe a little too much time to the idea, sorry, to the idea of uh, MFCC, which is really about the color and the sound, but in this class, we mostly talk about the structure of musical melodies and musical chords, uh, intervals. So in some sense, this is kind of a little bit outside of the main focus. The chromogram, yes. So we'll go back to the chromogram. And uh, tonnets is something that actually starts with the chromogram and goes one step further. Uh, instead of having the 12 pins of the chromogram, it gives you a six dimensional vector or a vector of six components, uh, which is so-called the tonnets, okay? So here I will just mention what it is and then we'll devote a whole um, set of slides explaining what the tonnets features are, okay? Um, so let me kind of just introduce the concept of tonnets, okay? and kind of try to give the big picture uh, why we started, let's say, with notes or frequencies, right? So notes are what we play on the keyboard. And, but uh, again, there was a certain already selection of specific frequencies that we choose as the notes. 
and then not only that, we also subdivided this into 12 frequency components that repeat themselves. And, and these 12 frequency components, we wanted to ignore the octave aspect. That's why we call it chroma or pitch class, okay? But not only that, not only now we already, by going from spectrum or Fourier transform, okay, into chroma, we already made here a lot of um, decisions or we, we did kind of a lot of extra processing where we lost deliberately a lot of information. We reduced, you know, the, the detail of the frequency by a huge amount, right? So from having thousands of bins, we are using only 12 bins. Now we go one step further and we reduce the 12 bins into six. Maybe it's not a huge reduction going from 12 to six, but this extra step actually reveals something very special about the music itself, which now takes into account something else, which is the structure of Western music theory. Okay, so by introducing these features, it's kind of like I give you a little bit of a heads up or spoiler that uh, we're going now to look into some mathematical representations. And this is where kind of the musical algorithm comes, part comes in. Some mathematical structure that is specific to the way not only we chose the 12 notes, but how we often choose a um, combination of these notes and specifically the idea that uh, we build uh, chords by uh, giving a lot of emphasis on uh, specific relations between simultaneous notes. So here what we have is actually three circles, okay? One that we call the fifth, one is the thirds, the minor and the major. Okay, so what are, what are these fifth minors and majors, okay? These are names now not of one interval, but of a distance between two intervals, okay? Oh, distance between two notes that we call an interval. So a musical interval basically is a distance in terms of a counting just a number of notes between either two notes that appear one after the other, usually you can play da da, they say, okay, da da, so it's like a fourth or something, or da da, da da. So these are like intervals, or if you play them together, of course, I can sing them together. You can also think about the, you know, the, the number of steps between two notes, uh, either if they play in succession or if they play together, okay? Um, so from all possible jumps or steps between two notes, we specifically wanna take an emphasis on uh, relations which are a fifth apart, a minor third and a major third, okay? Now, um, Going back to music theory, let's look at the keyboard here, okay? So we say like every adjacent step is, you know, a semitone, okay? Uh, and then you have basically uh, using um, whatever I know, I, I'm not sure historically what the name, you know, how the names came from, because this is not exactly counting the number of steps in the regular mathematical way. You can say this is a half step, this is a full step. Then if you go from this C, okay, C to C sharp is half step. C to D is a whole step. Then C to either you think about this as D sharp or E flat, okay? These like basically one, two, three semitones. Okay, we call it the third. Okay, very nice, it's three, but also this is a minor third. If you go one, two, three, four steps up, that's a major third. So this is where you know, the third and the, and the number of steps start being confusing. So from C to E flat, let's say, okay, this black key to this one, that's a minor third. From this one to this E, it's a major third. And then even more confusing, fifth is going well, it goes five steps on the white keys, one, two, three, four, five. Actually, if you go on the black, black and white keys, we go by semi semitones, seven steps. So from C to G, okay, that's called the fifth, okay? 
Uh, so please just kind of accept this or memorize these names. Okay, same thing like we memorized octave, which is eight steps on the white keys. Fifth is five steps on the white keys. But third, you have two of them. You have the major one, which is three steps on the white keys, and minor one, which is, you know, one step on the white keys. So there's actually two steps, like one, two, three notes. Here you get one, two, and half a step. So minor third, major third, and a fifth. Okay. Now, why we do that? So we'll talk a little bit later or next set of slides. We'll actually devote to talking about these specific choices of intervals, okay? Why they're so important in music, okay? And we'll have to talk about concepts of consonance and dissonance, or what combinations of frequencies actually uh, make a pleasant, and it's kind of, we can argue what, what pleasant means in this sense, but it makes some sort of a harmonious feeling when two notes play together, okay? And the idea is that, of course, if two notes you know, are octave apart, they pretty much blend because it's the same fundamental frequency and the harmonics will fall on each other. That's maybe the ideal blend, okay? But then we'll show that if you try kind of to rank and also try to explain why it happens physically and in terms of perception, maybe the next in line for the quality of blend of two tones becomes the fifth. And then you'll have the major thirds and the minor thirds. These are kind of the combination of notes that in some sense are pref I don't, preferred, okay? Psychoacoustically, physically. And again, we'll take, my, take the time to discuss this later today. And that's kind of an attempt maybe to justify some choices of musical notes, musical harmonies from the basics of physics and maybe psychoacoustics. Um, uh, as a quick disclaimer, I wouldn't carry this argument hugely forward, you know, with these physical based concepts, uh, you will not be able to define the differences between, you know, jazz and hip hop or classical music. I mean, there are so many other terms and statistics that will come later on that cannot be justified based on the physics itself, but at least in, in many, aspects and we'll even consider non-western music kind of trying to analyze some aspects of blend of different instruments and uh, in western music these could be pointed out as um, uh, some important factors that now we want to emphasize them or use them to summarize even further the idea of chromograph okay so what is the idea of of uh, uh, tonnets Tonnets basically takes 12 bins chromogram, okay? And now it maps them to these three circles. So if we have a chord A, okay, which has uh, notes which are A, okay? Uh, it has a note C sharp and has a note E. Um, I, I could try to write them down. Uh, I don't know how much it will help, maybe just, just for remembering so the chord a okay it comprises of the notes okay a of the note um, c sharp and the note e that's kind of the music theory this is the triad these are the three notes okay now if we try to map them to a keyboard and if you think about c as zero okay so C sharp will be one, okay? Sorry about you know the time it takes me to write. C sharp is one. Uh, and you can kind of, if you go back and you are able to trace all the names of you know C, D, E, F, G, A, okay? A will be nine, okay? C sharp is one, okay? And E will be four. I will let you kind of, verify this yourself you can basically count the number of steps in terms of like going white black white black or so-called chromatic steps or half steps on the keyboard you can see that uh, if we ignore the octaves and we assume that we count with c starting as zero uh, this is the representation of the chord a c sharp g 
as pitch classes, pitch class nine, pitch class one, pitch class four. Now, they might have different amplitudes, okay? So let's say this specific A chord, okay, has a certain component of nine and four and one. So this specific chord A is represented uh, as relative, you know, you have kind of to normalize this. These are the relative strengths of each one of these notes that comprise that chromogram. And we assume that the, all the other notes are actually have energy zero or they're not present in this A. It's a pure A, okay? We don't have any kind of spurious frequency showing up. So you can see that you can represent this chord as, as a two-dimensional point uh, with distances to these 12 notes on the circle for fifth, fifth, okay? And now again, this circle is, is built by going uh, uh, seven steps, fifth is seven semitones. And then every time we, we do this modulo 12, okay? So you can see that from zero, you add seven, you get seven. From seven, you add seven, you add that 14, okay? But 14 modulo 12 becomes, okay? And, and again, modulo 12 is because we ignore the octaves. Every 12 steps, we basically um, cycle back into something between zero and 11. So two is 14 more to 12. Then we have two plus seven is nine. 9 plus 7 more 12 is 4, and so on. So this is the circle of fifth, okay? And this is where the A lies. Now we can also position A on the circle of, let me just uh, move this, sorry. Um, now we can position our A on the circle of minor thirds, okay? Minor thirds is going from 0 to 3, from three to six, from six to nine, okay? Then from nine, okay? If we go, uh, and we said we go from, you know, zero to three, three to six, six to nine, nine plus three, okay? Uh, will be 12, okay? Now 12, uh, modulo 12 is zero again. So we completed this. Now we also, um, in just a second, let, let me see. Zero plus three plus six plus nine, 12, we end up at zero. Then we also take the other third, okay? Which is number four, seven, uh, 11 becomes, uh, okay, seven plus four is 11. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me one second to make sure that I'm doing doing the explanation correctly. So, so we have the zero, okay. So we have C, we have the E, e minor. So this is E minor, this will be G. Uh, so e, e flat, this is six, which is F sharp. This will be, uh, a, and that goes back to C, okay? So that kind of corresponds to moving three steps, you know, minor thirds from C. Then you actually start from, uh, instead of starting from C, you start from E, so four plus three, seven, okay? Seven plus three is 10, okay? And 10 plus three is 13 more 12, there'll be five. Okay, and then we go also eight. Eight plus three is 11. 11 plus three is 14 more 12, it's two. Okay, so we cover all of them, okay? Uh, and two plus um, uh, three is five. Okay, so I, I just got confused because they're kind of written, uh, sorted, but the jumps are not, okay? So I hope you followed me. So this is a circle of thirds, okay? That kind of takes um, steps of minor third, but puts on every uh, dot here notes which are actually major third apart. And then if you look at A, okay, which is again nine, one, and four, so it's in this case we kind of like use the nine and nine 
and one together and we sum them relative to nine and one okay and the four okay so on this axis it will show on this point okay at this point same thing if we go on major thirds okay so we aggregate actually all the nodes which are minor third apart as one point and the steps are major thirds uh, and if we do that okay uh, you can take again this 914 and you can see that that a will be presented here as one and four and nine uh, so i hope the math was clear it might look arbitrary why we do that okay but just you know bear with me uh, and just follow that logic so what we do in some sense we take every chord okay that comprises of let's say in this case three nodes you can have more nodes and you relate it to the distance to to its uh, basic uh, pitches okay on these three circles okay and that's how we design the circles so each point here is two-dimensional coordinate okay and this is what we have here okay what we have here is using r1 okay and these r's are usually you know we just take them as one and you can see that these are the steps okay in terms of um splitting this into the 12 uh, angles seven pi divided by six okay so we have sine and cosine here okay this is the x and y on this circle this is the x and y on the second circle and this is the x and y on the third circle so basically we take the two coordinates two coordinates and two coordinates here and we basically write them as one long vector and we have this expression okay so what what basically uh, we do is we can create this matrix okay and we can take our chroma okay and multiply this by uh, uh, by this why this is a matrix because this l is actually corresponding to all of the steps okay so l goes from zero to 11 here actually we also circle you know we circle three times here we circle four times so this goes from zero to 11 so actually this is a matrix because l is an index okay so this matrix we multiply our chroma by this matrix so chroma was 12 okay this will be also 12 numbers here right the l goes from zero so it will be sine of zero and then it'll be sine of seven pi divided by six okay so seven pi divided by six the, you know the first sine l equals one then it'll be 14 pi divided by six and so on okay so we get these uh, 12 so we have a row of 12 values here okay um so we have 12 okay and this is by six so this phi matrix is 12 by six okay and we multiply this by a vector which is you know uh, um we have six by right so we have six by one this is the chroma uh, sorry I, I did this opposite okay the matrix is we first write you know the the column dimension okay uh, so the matrix that we have is six by twelve this three matrix is six by twelve this is our matrix the phi matrix okay we multiply this by vector c which is a vector which is okay 12 by 1 right? this is the chroma and we end up with a vector which is six dimensional okay which is six by uh, six by one so this is one and this, okay so this is the chroma vector here this is the phi matrix and this becomes the tonnets vector great so i went through all of these explanations for what this 
graph means. Uh, I can uh, provide the reference to the paper that actually kind of explains this whole idea. But uh, for the purpose of this discussion, you know, all we can think is that this takes the 12 bins and represents this by uh, six dimensions, okay? Where every dimension kind of positions the chroma on relative to the circle of fifth, circle of minor thirds and, and circle of major thirds, okay? Now, uh, why this is interesting, okay? Why people actually uh, consider that? Well, what happens is that um, because so many chords, and again, we'll talk about this more uh, when we switch to the next set of slides. Uh, many chords, in some sense, are judged in terms of their amount of the fifth, fifth, minor thirds, and major thirds that are present inside the chords or between the different notes in the chord. So if we have a chord with three notes, you really can have relations between the first adjacent note, you know, the first note and the second note, the second note and the third note, the first note and the third note. So you can start analyzing all of the possible intervals within the notes and basically looking specifically at the relation between notes in terms of, you know, fifth relations, third relations, minor and major. And this vector summarizes that. Now, the interesting claim is that now, distances in terms of these six dimensional vectors represent distances between chords. Now that's very kind of a strong claim. It's, it's kind of surprising because what we said before was that the, um, let me stop the drawing, okay? So because, because before we said, okay, the chroma themselves kind of captured what notes exist in a chord. But now we want maybe to have a measure that tells you how far a chord D is from chord G or how far away the chord G is from chord C. Now, in some sense, this question itself uh, requires some, some explanation. What it means distance between chords, okay? Well, uh, that could be cultural thing. That could be also somehow justified maybe so acoustically. But the idea is that many times you know, we have this idea that chord leads to another chord, you know, G resolves to C, okay, or C leads to F. So there is this idea of how far or how much, I would say, uh, harmonic movement, you know, there, there are no physical terms here anymore, but in some sense, you could say in terms of cultural conventions and maybe justified by, by some psychoacoustics, uh, how close one chord is to another one, okay? So again, it's trying kind of to map chords to geometry, okay? And that will be, again, uh, kind of mentioned already several times. That will be the next set of slides. So there is kind of an underlying geometry that could be a representation of distances between chords, not notes anymore, but actually aggregates of notes. And this distance is summarized by this vector. So the interesting thing is that if you use these distances, you kind of can see how much change or surprise, if you want, happens between sequence of chords in the musical piece. So if you think now about something like a lychee, you know, a sequence of chords, this representation now allows you kind of to assign a distance over the steps between every chord. So you go from one chord from C to G or from C to F and from F you go back to C and from C you go to F and G and C, I don't know, whatever you're playing, it's a blues or something. Um, so every step like that is now translated to vector and now you can calculate distances between these vectors. And um, apparently that gives a good notion of smoothness in terms of actually now movement uh, of chords. Now, what is the equivalent, let's say in language? Uh, and I don't think this thing exists or in, in visual domain, basically you have a sequence of elements and, and then you kind of try to see how far a chord is from another chord. Uh, 
how would you how would you like find an analogy to that i'm not sure so we'll kind of try to justify this later the thing is that going back to the actual programming side of it okay we mentioned librosa okay and so this is one of the libraries and you already used this in in your first homework librosa takes all your signals and now does a bunch of feature extraction and analysis so um now, this is kind of a typical summary of different representations that you can take an audio signal using different Librosa functions, extract now um, information from the signal. So one is, we said, uh, FFT or Fourier transform, or if you do this over short times, and this is the spectrogram, it's also called short time Fourier transform, STFT. So this is a typical STFT. Uh, the log power is more like, you know, if you put here a legend of like what the grayscales mean, usually it's done in logs, which is so-called decibels. Again, I don't want to uh, spend much time on why instead of talking about the actual amplitude, you take log of the amplitude or there is even a specific number 20 log power of two of the amplitude that becomes a dB, okay? But the thing is every six dB is actually doubling the amplitude, okay? So very many times in you know, audio engineering, you use dBs in terms of you know, actual kind of uh, uh, root mean square energy values. Just accept this, I and mean, that's kind of the, the, the practice uh, in audio. So the energies here, basically, you know, the grayscale here are measured in terms of dBs. So this is short time Fourier transform, okay? Now we do the MEL spectrogram uh, representation looks very similar with the big distance difference being just in terms of the spacing on on this y-axis here it's linear right so you can see that you go from zero to whatever to 2756 that's doubling 5512 that's kind of uh, so the steps here should be steps of 2756 so 5512 plus 2756 that's in uh, 8268 yeah you can basically see that there is a basic linear step in frequency. This is linear frequency. Here, the jumps are logarithmical, okay? So this is log, that's the, where the male spectrum goes. And it's logarithmical with that specific way that it's linear where there's higher resolution, low frequencies and start being logarithmical uh, further up, okay? So that's the male spectrogram. Then this is summarized into 12 pitch classes here. So you have 12 bins, okay? And here are the names of the notes, okay? C, there's a C sharp in the middle, D, D sharp in the middle, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, or B flat and B, okay? So you have now 12 bins. So it takes this and summarizes this into that. And then you take the pitch class and you summarize this into six numbers, which would be the distance on the circle of fifth, distance on the circle of minor thirds, and distance on the circle of major thirds, okay? So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six vectors. And then the question is, well, what do you do with them? These are kind of your basic representations that you can handle later on to analyze music in terms of really structures that are typical to, let's say, Western music that is played on a keyboard that has 12 notes, which are tuned using equal tuning, okay? And that prefers these triad structures. Now, physics, okay, perception, that's how our frequency analysis is done, you know, in, in the inner ear. Uh, first level of choices of choosing 12 notes for musical instruments, okay, so this is maybe now specific to tunings, okay, Western tuning. And this even goes further. This is specific to rules of harmony of Western music, popular music, and so on. Uh, and again, why we want to use them? Because now in these subspaces, you know, six, six dimensional subspace or 12 dimensional subspace, we can now start looking at the relations between sequences of notes or sequences of you know, pitch classes, okay, aggregates of notes as they move over time, and analyze them for different properties okay so it might have been a little confusing 
just in terms of like, okay, there's a lot of music theory kind of behind all of these features. They're manually designed, you know, somebody set and actually engineered these features. You would say, why not use neural networks to learn them? Well, yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, there are attempts to find representations which maybe are adaptive just by you know, showing a lot of musical examples and saying what is the right representation, what is the subspace in which you capture a lot of structure. Uh, so since we're not dealing with machine learning here, but we're dealing with, uh, sorry, human engineered features, these are kind of typical features that actually were designed to capture uh, aspects of musical sound, which are very typical either to perception or to um, musical culture. Uh, so I will kind of stop here and see if we have any, any questions before I move on um, to the next set of slides. Yeah, so these are kind of the, the musical features that we extract. And we will talk also about pitch class and chroma also uh, using written notation. Okay, so Librosa does that for uh, you know, audio signals, does frequency analysis, and then represent this in terms of uh, chroma and tonnets. Um, but before you know, even going there, um, uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, I'll answer in a second, Tim, may your question. Yeah. Um, so even before that, I think we need a little bit to dive into notions of consonance and dissonance, okay? So for the paper that I mentioned, uh, let me quickly show it. So Tim is asking, oh yeah, you send it to everyone. So what is what is the research paper you mentioned that these tonnets slides reference? Let me quickly... Uh, try to show it up and then I can also drop it uh, in the readings folder if you wish. I don't think maybe it's there. Let me just verify before I share screen. Sorry, go to the wrong drive. Okay, um, yes, okay, uh, she takes me too long to find exactly what's on the drive. And so uh, let me just kind of show, show the paper itself. So, uh, yeah, so this is um, uh, Mark Sandler's lab in Queen Mary and, and uh, um, this, well, Chris Hart and uh, Martin Gazer detecting harmonic changes from 2006, uh, taking harmonic change in musical audio. So this is the specific way of representation that is meant for changes in harmony, okay? It kind of describes here uh, the process. Uh, and we will today discuss these representations, okay, donuts and this torus representation. This is kind of a musical theory concept that what existed before, you know, the, the six dimensional vector was uh, suggested for audio. So this is just the way representing notes. So we'll talk about this. So it kind of uses a uh, musical theory, which is so-called like uh, Riemann theory, or neo Riemannian theory of uh, representing notes on a grid or notes on a torus. And then it actually explains this algorithm, okay? And 
and this is where I took the slides from, or the figures on the slides are from this paper. And basically it kind of tells you that, you know, there could be like tonal region, something happening in music. And then there's a different tonal region that something else happens in the music. But when there is a big transition, that's where you have a distance between tonal centroid frames. So this is kind of a change really in terms of Western music concepts, okay? Um, yeah, so then you basically have a change detection function which uses these vectors and just uses a Euclidean distance between these vectors, okay, to calculate how much surprise or change there is in chords. And, you know, they analyze this in terms of the amount of harmonic changes in different songs and so on. Um, so this is kind of a very, uh, again, human design feature based on a lot of music theory, which is relying on these tonal grids that we'll discuss later on, okay? So this is kind of the reference. I'll, I'll drop it in the, in the readings folders, okay? Um, okay, that's another question. Okay, good. Um, all right, so let, let's then, uh, Okay, let's start with, 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 with the next set of slides, okay? Uh, which will discuss the concept of consonance and dissonance, and then uh, hopefully it won't take too much time to take a break. Um, okay, so the question, can you define again what the D, L, and C, and R, and what are the values of R1, R2, and R3, okay? So I can go back to the slides so we can look in the paper itself, okay? Um, yeah, so, so D and so phi, this capital phi, okay? Is this matrix, which is six, okay? Uh, by 12, okay? So it's six, so the, these are indices, okay? From zero to five, and L are indexes from zero to 11. So this is a matrix that has, uh, you know, it has six rows, okay, or the column size is six, and it has uh, 12 columns, okay, or, or every row has 12 indices. So this is six by 12, okay? So from zero to five, these will be the tonnets components, and from zero to 11, these are the chroma components. So these are just two indices, okay? Now, uh, when, um, when they run these Rs, uh, there is a little bit of an arbitrary choice. How, what, what is the R? These are kind of the radiuses of this representation, okay? So um, it seems very natural to take them all once, okay? But for some reason, and you know, uh, we can check what is the exact implementation also in Librosa, uh, but the paper pr proposes to have R1 and R2 as one, and R3 is 0 0.5. Why they choose to you know, take this circle and squeeze it by two, uh, you know, that's an excellent question, but I don't have an answer, okay? Um, you know, in some sense, it would make sense just to keep them all once and then you just ignore these intervals. You, you basically only have the, the cosine signs here, but um, they chose this and... Um, um, I mean, they refer to it, another work by Elaine Chu, uh, who was also, well, I mean, uh, she was in, in uh, USC and then Queen Mary in Irkham, Queen Mary. Uh, she, she actually proposed this idea of the spiral array that we saw before. And she claimed that this is the, ra the, the ratio of height to diameter. Um, I, I haven't investigated this to the point of actually being able to justify to you now why exactly they chose R1 and R2 as ones and R3 is 0 0.5. But that's why they have these different values rather than just take, take them all as one and just consider the angles, okay? So unfortunately, I, I, I don't know how to answer it for your question. Uh, maybe, you know, it would be interesting to kind of dive deeper and, and see where, why they are. Um, okay, so, um, so let's try to move on and see where we are on, oops. 
Let me quickly find the slides before I can scroll through all the open tabs. Oh, okay, that was a full screen, that's why I think then. Uh, all right. All right, so, so uh, let's move to the next set of slides for, for the first part of the class. Uh, and what I wanna talk about is, uh, uh, before we talk about the spaces, that'll be after the break, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of roughness. Okay, again, kind of music theory, uh, trying to um, give a mathematical or physical uh, justification for some concepts. Um, all right. So, um, you know, one of the basic concepts in listening to music and, and, and uh, thinking about intervals is um, in musical terms and uh, we we try to distinguish between so sounds or combination of tones that sound nice together and we call it consonant versus combination of tones that um, are um, I, I don't know how to call them except for using the term dissonance that kind of are less pleasant, uh, less harmonious, okay? And we'll see in a second what they are. So basically, um, musicians usually talk about two classes, consonant and dis dissonant, but also within these classes, there are these gradations, okay? So the names of the intervals we mentioned, octave, sorry, octave will be, you know, 12 tones apart, Okay, or eight white keys. Fifth will be five white keys or seven steps. Fourth will be, so if this is C, so C to C is octave. C to G is fifth. Actually going from G to C above it becomes a fourth or C to F is a fourth, okay? C to E is a major third, okay? Actually C to E flat, or if you go from E to G, is a minor third, C to A is a six, and E to C uh, is a minor, minor six. Um, for, you know, I advise for anyone who kind of is not really fluent with these things, just like maybe look, you know, uh, open a keyboard, uh, either like if you have a accessible keyboard or, or find one of the kind of piano apps, and and kind of locate these these intervals, okay? But these are basically distances between notes on on the piano keyboard, okay? Now, in terms of frequency ratios, uh, these are the semitones. Sorry, so this is kind of walking in terms of you know half steps, okay? And now we talk about frequency ratios. Now, there is another small disclaimer, okay, which is that um, in 12 tones, we gave a specific equation that told you that every step is, you know, is a multiplier in frequency by, by a step, which is a 12th root of two, right? Um, if you open up the, the first set of slides, we have the note to frequency, and that's also what you do in your homework. You actually calculate this uh, in slightly different way, which is the way the well-tempered tuning is done. But if you think about ideal frequency ratios, okay, uh, they're, um, they're the more traditional ways of these kind of tuning systems that were used before, uh, before the 12-tone tuning system was invented. And they're based really on the harmonics, okay? So what, what does it mean? If you look at... Uh, fundamental and partials of a note, okay? 
we said that they're all multiples of you know, the lower frequency. So if you have a node that has 100 frequencies, the lower partial, the second partial will be 200 and then 300 and so on. Now, what happens is that, let's say from 100 to 200, you have an octave because it's doubling. But then from 200 to 300, it's a ratio, okay, relative to the first one of three over two, okay? So you have the ratio 100 to 200, it's times two, 200 to 300 is three to two, okay? Then if you go from the 300 to the next one, which is 400, and I said it can go from G to C, which is the same as going from C to F, that becomes four to three. So if you really try to tune your notes to match the partials, okay, the harmonic partials, you end up with approximately these relations or these notes as ideal frequency ratios. So this would be the ratios of the closest harmonics to the notes. So uh, it's true that in well-tempered tuning, uh, these are not ideal frequency ratios. They are close to it, but they're not the same, okay? So, um, so let us kind of uh, look for a second what happens, why we choose these nice ratios and, or how they're related to consonants, okay? In some sense, you could even say here that what we do, we go, you know, the consonant intervals are the ones that have these nice integer relations between frequencies, okay? So in the fifth, the relations between the fundamentals of two notes will be three to two. In the fourth, the relations between the frequencies of the, the pitches will be four to three and so on. So how can we justify or explain kind of this preference to notes that uh, have nice frequency ratios, okay? And to talk about this, we need to talk about something which we call tonal interaction, okay? Which is what happens in our perception when we have sinusoids that are close to each other, okay? And this is where we go back to this idea that we saw in the male spectrum that we have these kind of filters or, that have bandwidth. And within that bandwidth, in some sense, we don't really distinguish between two frequencies. So what is the idea? Let's say you have a specific note, okay? And that note um, now is, starts being split into two notes or two frequencies which are very close apart, okay? So as we kind of move away from that one note uh, within that one critical bandwidth, we wouldn't be able to perceive two different notes. What we'll feel is one note that has this beating effect, okay? And, and I'll, we'll demonstrate this in a second, okay? So um, when we have two very closely spaced sine waves, Okay, what we perceive is basically one sine wave that has some kind of a modulation, okay? Now, as these sine waves split and go further away, it comes to the point that before we start feeling that these are two different notes, okay? So we have this uh, idea that we do perceive now two separate notes. In between, we have this kind of a fusion of notes that has when it approaches, before it breaks away and you actually can hear the two notes, we feel uh, this sense of um, roughness, okay? So let me, um, before moving further, okay? Let me kind of demonstrate this idea of roughness, okay? Uh, so to do that, I'll have to kind of quickly open uh, Audacity. Be, we can do this in Python as well, but it's you know, maybe a little more visual and easy in Audacity, okay? And what I want to do is, um, uh, generate two sine waves, okay? So we'll, we'll take uh, the generate notion and, uh, uh, we'll create basically uh, two things, okay? We'll create, let's, sorry, let's create a tone, okay? Uh, let's say a sine wave, 
and that's not okay. Yeah, sorry, it generate something without planning. Okay, generate down at let's say uh, an A. Um, let's say to 20. We take an octave in A, which is um, below the middle C. Okay. And duration, yeah, three seconds. Okay. So here we have uh, a sine wave. Let me play it. Yep. I mean, these little wiggles are just, just an aspect of um the way we see it it, it actually doesn't uh, zoom in yeah, oops so you can see we have this very nice side wave okay now uh what i would like to do is uh generate uh, a chirp which will be a frequency that slowly moves up uh, and changes the fundamental frequency. And what we'll do, we'll start with the same frequency of 220, okay? We still have the three seconds. And let's let's go, uh, well, three seconds, good. We, we don't want it, it's pretty fast. So um, let's, Let's go a fifth apart, okay? So, um, or fifth may be even too much. Um, so instead of going 440, um, whatever, 330, okay. So let's generate uh, another sine wave here. Oops, I stepped on the first one. Okay. Okay, that's the three seconds. So this is the chip, let me just play the chip. I'll have to repeat the first one before. Okay, so this is our chip frequency going up and, and we'll open, okay. Let's do another track. And this track will generate the initial tone, which was our sine wave with some duration, okay? So we have a constant tone and we have another tone. Now let's play them together, okay? Um, so, and let's hear what happens, okay? So uh, maybe that's a little fast, but if, if we just uh, zoom in on the first segment, right, with both nodes, and uh, we want to loop it, okay? Right, so in this section, you can see that we don't really hear two notes, okay? If we go a little further, okay? You hear that we still hear one tone, but it has this kind of a very fast beating. And if we go further here, let's just grab somewhere here, okay? So the clicks are because you know we kind of cut away from jump back, but now you can hear two tones, right? And if we go further, even that's where we definitely hear. Um, I don't think we're hearing the tones. Oh, you, you you couldn't hear anything that I'm playing. Okay, sorry. So we need to set up. My apologies. Will be the. Zoom audio. Okay, hopefully, tell me now if you hear it and then I'll just repeat everything. But you hear, 
Yes. Can you hear? Okay. So let, let me now, <laughs> my apologies, let me go again and repeat everything with you. Okay. So I generated chirp and I generated constant sine wave. So if I solo this one, I can just play this one and go all the way back. This is a constant sine wave. Right? That's pretty clear. Okay. Now I'll go and I generate this one, which is going slowly up. Okay. And that's how it sounds. Okay. Now what I want to um, what I'm trying to demonstrate, what I want to ask you how you receive it is basically uh, okay, now we have both of them active. What happens, let's say, when we listen to the first section, where basically we have almost the same tone, right? So if I play it, I'll be looping it. So it will be clipping when, when it repeats, but between you know, between the clips, or between the clicks, uh, let's listen to it. Right, so there's this kind of a little bit of a wah wah effect, okay? And then if we go a little further, okay, we still perceive this as one note with modulation. Let's move a little further, okay? We can still not, we were not able to distinguish the two notes. We hear them as fast beating, right? And then uh, if we move even further, okay. We don't perceive this as one note. We perceive this as something which maybe has a fast beating that we would call now roughness. Why it's roughness? Well, that's the term. But in some sense, it, it, I think you will agree with me that it creates a sense of some kind of an unpleasant sensation. Okay. And if we go even further, okay, maybe we start hearing two notes, it's still hard. And then if we move farther away, suddenly we hear two notes and we don't hear the beating, right? And farther away, we definitely will hear two notes. So this, this is the whole idea behind uh, what's the zoo thing? And there was a question. OK, so you were able to hear the sound, right? Yeah. So um, let me go back and find where were the yeah okay so this was the whole idea of the roughness representation that actually uh, tries to say that there is certain limit. There's kind of a bandwidth which corresponds to what we call the critical bandwidth of, of, of the year, where you cannot distinguish between two tones, but when the distance between the tones approaches this critical bandwidth, at the transition between hearing one tone to two tones, we have this very fast beating that is called roughness. Okay, so this is the whole idea of tonal interaction, actually, how we perceive when we have two notes playing together. Okay. Now, um, um, researchers came up, you know, psychoacoustic researchers uh, came up with this measure of roughness as a function of different notes, okay? So really, uh, the, it depends on what is the frequency of the lower tone, because it depends on the, on the critical bandwidth that kind of changes as we, um, you know, change the frequency. But these curves basically represent kind of the sensory dissonance. And that's kind of the idea that, you know, as two notes start going farther apart in terms of a frequency, there is a point where we have maximal roughness and then this roughness starts disappearing, okay? And people came up with uh, an approximation, uh, kind of functional representation of these curves in terms of this equation that I'm not going to kind of justify, but this gives you 
the roughness measure between two nodes, two ideal sine waves, depending on their amplitudes. Okay, so the, the lower frequency and the second frequency, uh, and also so the f max and f min, the lower and the, uh, the higher frequency and the lower frequency, and the relative amplitudes. Okay, so let's assume that this is kind of a, an, an equation that somebody came up with that describes the sensory dissonance. Okay, now this works only for pure tones. Now, what happens even more interestingly is if we consider now complex tones. And we said complex tones are tones that comprise of multiple harmonics. Okay, because we said that, you know, a real waveform is not an ideal sine wave. And it might have, and you know, mostly, mostly or more often, it will have many different uh, partials. Okay, so these partials, um, the fundamental frequency, the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on. Let's say we just take a few of them. And now let's look at relations between the lower note and the upper note. Okay, so if the lower note has these harmonics and the upper note starts octave apart, you can see that their harmonics actually overlap, okay? The second harmonic of the lower note actually falls exactly on the frequency of the first or the fundamental of the upper note, okay? And so on. So in that sense, there is this ideal blending between two notes which are octave apart. Okay? Now, if you look at ideal fifth, which should be relations of three to two in terms of frequencies, you can see that you know these partials not they do not overlap. The first doesn't overlap the first here. The second one is alone, but the third one actually overlaps. The fourth and the fifth start maybe creating a little bit of a dissonance because that's where the bandwidth starts being wide enough, and that falls within that roughness area. But that's kind of one of the few. If we take only the lower, let's say four or five harmonics. In some, sense, in some sense, we only have one collision here. We have one point of roughness. If we look at fourth, you can see that you, they have more roughness points. The major third has two roughness points. A minor second, which is just a semitone, okay, actually has all of the harmonics kind of close, but not, they're, they're not close enough to perceive one note. You already perceive them as two notes, but they're all kind of hitting that roughness boundary. So actually all of the harmonics uh, create the sensation of this very fast beating or unpleasant sensation. And there's a special interval, which is called a tritone, which is going from C to F sharp, just one before fifth, where we do get these collisions or these roughness points, okay, on the upper harmonics. So the interesting thing is that if we were playing a tritone uh, only with a pure note, and not only the tritone, you know, like if you fourth, if it's playing only with, with pure tones, you would not even have these collisions. These collisions happen also here on the lower partials, but started from the third one. Here they also started from the third one. So uh, in some sense, the sensation of, of this unpleasant beating that happens between some other intervals really occurs because of interactions on the higher harmonics, okay? If we didn't have these higher harmonics, we wouldn't feel practically, except for the end, that the first element where we kind of move away from perception of one note to two notes, where we had the roughness, all the rest in some sense doesn't give us any unpleasant feelings. But if we now use complex timbers, okay, if we use uh, harmonics of actual instruments, we get these sensations of roughness in the higher frequencies, but we still perceive them, but we perceive them in an unpleasant way. So this is kind of the attempt to explain the concept of consonance dissonance based on this basic fundamental effect of tonal interaction of two frequencies on the boundaries of the critical bandwidth. So if you take this now graph, which is for sine waves, and you try kind of to extrapolate this or multiply this by all of the frequencies and all of the partials and how they interact, people come up with these consonants function, okay, for harmonic complexes, okay? 
And if you actually do that calculation, you basically overlay that first graph of the dissonance with all the partials and you sum them together. Of course, it depends on the actual you know, amplitudes of these partials, uh, but given, let's say, some idealized form with, let's say, four or five partials, you add them up together and you come up with this sort of graph that shows you that, you know, unison or the same note, okay, has no roughness. Then as we move away from the same note and we approach the minor second, okay, uh, you get a lot of beating just before, but it's still here, is, there is a lot of roughness, okay? And then as we go further, farther away, okay, the roughness starts decreasing and there is a dip next to the minor third, there is a dip next to the major third, there is a dip on the fourth, there is almost zero roughness on the fifth, there is a dip on the sixth, and there is zero roughness on the octave. So actually, by using this kind of a logic, saying there is a psychoacoustic effect of beating, which is a result of two tones, you know, being a part, you know, critical bandwidth away, or half critical bandwidth away, and then taking into account that this is an unpleasant effect. And this unpleasant effect could be represented as this sensory dissonance curve for this calculation. And then we overlay all the other partials and take into account all of the beatings between higher partials. We end up with this curve. And then we look at the points where we have this minima, which means the more pleasant intervals. And these more pleasant intervals actually correspond to musical concept of consonants, okay? So this is one way to justify really why uh, there's this choice of specific intervals uh, that we want to, um, you know, build our chords to be more pleasant. And if we want them to be more pleasant, we actually want to create combinations of tones that have these nice frequency relations between complex, um, um, well, they're, they're all complex tones, okay? So the tone itself has a lot of partials, and then we add them together, and we basically see how many of these collisions happen. And it appears that the, the, the major and the minor third, the fourth and the fifth, and then also correspondingly the major sixth and the octave uh, are the more pleasant combinations of intervals. Now, all of these things are actually implemented in, um, in musical uh, software. So you can actually now take combination of notes and kind of tell or calculate without, you know, without even listening to this, right? And say how pleasant will that chord sound by doing the same type of calculation, okay? Now, uh, I think before we, um, yeah, this is, this is an interesting video, so maybe, uh, but it's a little bit long, but okay. Allow me before we take a break to listen to it, but then so we can just go to the break after immediately after the video. I'll just go one slide down, okay? And Gamelan, sorry, uh, and propose lab, okay? So uh, I dropped in the folder of the assignments. And again, this is not a graded assignment. This is something that we could either think about doing today if we have enough time, although I think we're kind of like going, uh, I wouldn't say a little slow, we just introduced a lot of concepts. So I'm not sure we'll have the time to do this. It, what I'm suggesting is kind of, mm, well, not exactly repeat what I did on Audacity because Audacity did something slightly different, just demonstrate the roughness. But I dropped in the assignment folder, two Python files, okay? One is uh, something that allows you to synthesize a complex waveform. You specify, they're like a template, you know, how many partials you want with what amplitude, and it will generate. So it does, instead of synthesizing sinus, it, it, it synthesizes some of sinus states, okay? So you can synthesize um, a single tone, and then you can add them together to create uh, two intervals. Let's say a fifth and a tritone. Now, to do this, of course, you need to look up what is the fifth, okay? 
you can do this using either the, the ideal relations of three to two and calculate what is a tritone or use the approximate 12 tuning calculation. But you create these two intervals, okay? And you do this once using a sinusoid, pure tone, which means you call the same complex only with one component, or second time using a harmonic complex, basically create some kind of a, a tone that has multiple partials, okay? So you actually, what I suggest to do in this kind of a um, lab, if you want, okay? And we'll see I mean, if, we, if we actually want to do this or, or we leave this optional. Uh, you create basically uh, two, ver two intervals with two versions of sounds, one sample timbre and one complex term. And then I provide another implementation from Seth Harris, who is a researcher that actually calculated or used this distance curve that we saw before. And it allows you to plug in you know, something that has that template. You actually have to specify what harmonics we're using here. It will give you the dissonance value for these intervals. And then uh, the idea would be that, you know, with the synth complex, you can actually synthesize an interval and listen to it. And by just taking, you know, the numbers of the frequency and frequency as you partials, you plug it here and you get some numerical value. And the whole idea is kind of to see that, you know, you create this. And, you know, and sensation of dissonance or consonance um, in a different way if you use a sinusoid. And kind of a spoiler would be that in some sense, if you have a sinusoid, there will be no dissonance in a triton versus the fifth. But if you use a complex interval, the triton will be sounding very dissonant and the, the Cessler's dissonance curve will also show you that these, this interval is very dissonant, but then if you plug in a perfect fifth, it will show you that this combination of intervals is actually consonant or has very low dissonance value. So this is just kind of a way to numerically, if you want, replicate the, you know, the whole story I was telling you about before, okay? So besides kind of the idea that um, there is, possibly a certain justification to the choices of consonant and dissonant intervals based on the timbre or based on the harmonic complexes. Um, uh, I would like enough to uh, play this video that actually tries to use the same theory to explain tuning in non-Western music. And um, in, in this case, you know, in Gamelan, you know, the Slender and Pelog uh, are actually two different tuning systems that are specific to, sp to different musical instruments that are used in gamelan. And these instruments have their own complex timbres, okay? So the idea is that you don't only can apply this dissonance theory to ideal harmonic complexes like the you know, pitched signals that have ideal harmonics. Maybe you can apply this to like percussion instruments, okay? or, or uh, metallophonics, which have timbres which are much more complex. They're not even harmonic, okay? And then using this type of analysis, try to find out what combinations of these notes actually sound consonant and dissonant. And if you write them down, it might explain why let's say in, dissonant, in, in gamelan, there is no, the scales for the notes that we play are not anywhere close to what we find on the Western keyboard, okay? They actually have tuning systems and scales which are tuned very differently. And then the question is why? So I propose to see this video and then we can actually uh, take a break and, um, um, and go back to tonnets, okay? Which then goes back to the idea that only the thirds and the major, the minor thirds on the fifth, are kind of the dominant structures for Western music. But yeah, let's watch this video that actually deals with non-Western music using the concept of consonants and dissonance. So I'll, I'll play that video. Uh, I think the sound is shared, you should be able to hear it. I don't, I don't think I need to set it as Zoom, but if you don't hear it, just you know, shout, please, yeah. 
Gamelan is traditional Indonesian music originating from islands of Java and Bali. It is performed in religious practices and for entertainment. Why it is interesting from a musical theory standpoint? I think because the tuning of Gamelan is vastly different from a Western chromatic scale. There are two tuning systems in Gamelan, Slendro and Pelag. If we compare them with chromatic scale that we use, we can see that there is no familiar intervals, no fifth, no thirds, and even the octave is a bit off. Because of that, there is no familiar scales, chords, and chord progressions. So there is no point for analyzing gamelan with Western music theory. This really makes gamelan unique, and this tradition emerged naturally, just like the Western. So what led Indonesians to pick those intervals for their music and not the ones that we use? And do we have anything to learn from it? I will attempt to answer those questions in this video. Let's go. Firstly, there are two varieties of gamelan, Javanese and Balinese. They do sound different as typical set of instruments is slightly different, and Balinese gamelan has specific tuning peculiarities. But to keep things simpler, I'm going to talk only about Javanese gamelan as most of things should be common between both varieties. So let's get familiar with typical Javanese gamelan instruments. Those who are familiar with that can skip that part. Four groups of instruments can be identified. Metallophones, gongs, percussion, and melodic instruments. Let's go through them. And before we start, I want to apologize if I pronounce anything in the wrong way. First metallophone is called saron, and it consists of seven bronze bars on top of resonating frame. It comes in three sizes that cover different registers. It plays major role in gamelan as it plays the main melody of the piece. Next metallophone is called Genda. It has a different shape of bronze bars than Saron, so it has a different timbre. It consists of 10 to 14 bronze bars that are suspended by rods over tuned resonators made from bamboo or metal. The lower pitched version of Genda is called Slantham. Another instrument is called gambang. It is a xylophone, not a metallophone, as bars are made of wood and it covers a wide register of several octaves. That does it with metallophones. Another very important set of instruments in gamelan are gongs. The first one I will mention plays a major role in gamelan and it is called bunang. It is a collection of tuned horizontally laid gongs that go in two rows and are tuned asymmetrically. It also comes in different sizes to cover different registers. It plays decorative melody on top of the main one. Next instrument is Ketuk Kempion. Gongs in gamelan play a very important role in the structure of music. They mark off cyclical time intervals that divide the composition. That is called colotomy. Smaller gongs, like Kithuk Kempyang, keep the regular beat of music. The larger gongs, like Gong Kenong, group together these hits into larger groupings, playing once per each grouping. Kenong is the largest laid gong that has individual stand for each gong, but it is smaller than some hanging gongs. Gamelan has large variety of hanging gongs that used to indicate the structure of composition. The collection of smaller hanging gongs is called Kempu, and the largest gong is Gong Agang. It represents the longest time cycle in composition, and it is actually the most important instrument in Gamelan ensemble. As due to mythology surrounding Gamelan tradition, it is considered sacred. Gamelan also uses percussion instruments. Typical for Javanese gamelan is two-headed drum kendang. It is very important as its player sets the rhythm of the music piece. It also plays the role of the beat for dancing performance that is accompanied by gamelan music. And the last group of instruments plays melodic role. It is suling, the flute-like instrument. Rebab, bowed two-string instrument. and sitter, a harp-like instrument. 
Also, some GAML NPCs implement Cining. Ok, so now we are familiar with typical gamelan instruments, let's see how they are tuned. Gamelan metallophones and gongs are tuned into two stages. First one is rough tuning that is done in furnace by giving gongs and plates rough shape. And then it is fine tuned by filing parts of plates and gongs. That filing affects both the note and timbre as pitch and amplitude of some overtones can be controlled, though within limits. First instrument to be tuned is Genda. Then the rest of instruments are tuned to it. Once tuned, instruments stay in tune for decades until time and corrosion will shift tuning too far and it will require retuning. Though at that point it is impossible to restore the original tuning, so the ensemble will sound different. The notes in gamelan are usually referred to as numbers. In the low register around 180 Hz, the tuning for Slendra and Paylog will look something like that. Not a single instrument can be tuned to both those systems at once. So the instruments really come in sets, one for each tuning. So Saron from Slendra set cannot be played in Pelog Ensemble. Going up to the middle register in the same gamelan we see that tuning shifts, and quite noticeably, up to 30 cents. In higher register, again, the tuning is slightly shifted. That is quite unusual as Western tuning is uniform in all registers. For simplicity, from now on I will use averaged values for notes in Slendra and Pelog. We see that Slendra is dividing an octave evenly, and thus it is close to 5 tone equal temperament. And Pelic is non equally tempered tuning and is not well approximated with notes from chromatic scale. But deviations of tuning with register is not the whole story. Gamelan masters don't use tuning forks but rely on their memory and may use famous Gamelan as a reference for making tuning decisions. Therefore, tuning differs between different ensembles. Here are values for average tunings for two different gamelan ensembles taken from the book Tuning Timbre Spectrum Scale, and third tuning I measured myself using free sample library for contact from Casada Musica. Link in the description. We see that even though there are definitely common features, exact values for pitches are different for different ensembles. Therefore, same music piece will sound different if played with different gamelan ensemble. You can check this out yourself on this site. Link in the description, it has several recordings of the same piece played on several Balinese gamelan ensembles. Another thing that makes gamelan instruments unique apart from tuning is their timbre or spectrum that they produce. To understand the difference, let's start with common western musical body, vibrating string. Just by itself, string does not produce musical tone, but sounds more like a noise. And the spectrum contains all the frequencies in certain interval, roughly with the same amplitude. To produce musical tone, we have to apply tension. So let's put it into my guitar. Now the string is locked tight in the bridge here and in the nut here. So this is the length of the string that is vibrating. When we plug the string, we give it energy to start vibrating. And at first few moments, it vibrates at almost all frequencies. But very quickly, vibrations at most of frequencies lose their energy. This happens because in order to vibrate at those frequencies, the string have to move up and down at the ends, which are held by the bridge and the nut of the guitar. So the string fights the body of the guitar and of course loses. The result is that those frequencies get attenuated very quickly. The frequencies at which a string vibrates sustainably are called modes of vibration and are such that half period of the vibration fits exactly inside the length of the string. Such frequencies are fundamental, exact numerical value depends on the length of the string and tension, second harmonic with twice the frequency, third with three times the frequency, and so on. Such spectrum in which partials are whole number multiples of fundamental frequency is called harmonic spectrum. Different situation happens with metal plates in gamma and metallophones. In this picture of Genda, you can see that the plates are suspended by the cables in two points, here and here. That means that the ends of the plates are free to vibrate however they want. Such vibrations are much more complicated and depend on exact shape of the bar. As an example, here are possible modes of vibration for free ideal rectangular plate. Frequencies of those modes are not necessarily whole number multiples of fundamental. Indeed, if we plot the spectrum of a single note played on Genda from Casada Musical Library, 
we get the following spectrum. Spectrum that does not follow harmonic series as it has non-integer ratios to fundamental. Such spectrum is called inharmonic. With harmonic instruments, ratio of partial frequency to fundamental does not change much and stays close to harmonic series. But in gamelan, spectrum of each node in each register are noticeably different. To find typical spectrum of a gamelan instrument, let's limit ourselves to middle register and measure spectrum of every note in the octave for Saron. We see that indeed, there is a variation in spectrum of nodes, but some partials can be identified as close enough. Let's take such partials and average their ratios. This way we find typical Saron spectrum. In my previous video, Can Octave Sound Dissonant? I explained how spectrum of a single note is related to the tuning and scales used in Western music. Spectrum of metallophones in gamelan do not follow harmonic series, but the same process that relate harmonic series to Western tuning works in gamelan, but leads to slender and pelag. First, let me briefly explain what is dissonance curve. One of psychophysiological contributions to musical dissonance comes from beating of nearby partials of a sound. Beating is pulsating sound that happens when two sine waves of close frequencies sound simultaneously. Effect of beating on our perception of dissonance can be experimentally measured by asking group of participants to rate how dissonant different pairs of sine waves sound. That was done in 1965 and published in the article Tonal Consonance and Critical Bandwidth by Plomp and Leveled. They obtained the following result. This graph represents the sweep of two sine waves and corresponding value of sensory dissonance from 0 to 1. Because tones of conventional musical instruments like guitar consist of many individual sine waves forming harmonic series, we can use Plomp and Level's result to calculate the analogous graph but for harmonic spectrums. One spectrum will be static and another will sweep all frequencies in the span of one octave. While with some contributions to dissonance from every pair of sine waves in both spectrums. And we will get this graph that has many dips in dissonance. They happen in places where partials of a sound coincide, thus reducing overall dissonance and mark the notes of just intonation. Just intonation is somewhat impractical tuning system and today we use 12-tone equal temperament that sacrifices purity of harmony of just intonation but simplifies the life of a musician a great deal. We can see that not every note falls perfectly on the deep in dissonance curve. Some notes do not have corresponding deep at all. So we should expect some imperfections, as many things apart from beating alone can affect how we tune our instruments. Consider dissonance curves as rough indication to where you want place notes to get useful tuning. Obviously, form of dissonance curve depends on frequencies and amplitudes of partials in spectrum. If we use only two first partials of harmonic spectrum, the dissonance curve will have dips only at unison and the octave. Going to three partials, we get the dip at perfect fifth then perfect fourth, and so on. At eight partials, dips that do not correspond to any particular note from chromatic scale start to appear. Though we don't really distinguish such high partials that well, so there is no point to go any further. Changing the amplitudes of partials in spectrums will change how deep the dips are, but won't change their place in frequency. Now we can apply the same approach of drawing dissonance curves to see if it works with gamelan. We have our typical spectrums for Saron, Genda and Bunang from Casa da Musica contact library. When calculating dissonance curves, we will use them as static spectrum. And as sweeping spectrum, we will use four first partials of harmonic spectrum. That is so because melodic instruments in gamelan like Sulin, Rebab and Sitter and voice have harmonic spectrum and they have to harmonize with metallophones. So this is what we get for Saron tuned to Slendro. We can clearly see that dissonance curve correlates very well with actual Slendro tuning this particular gamelan is tuned to. Same thing can be done for Genda and Bunang. Different instruments give different dissonance curves, but with dips roughly at the same place. Averaging between all dissonance curves, we clearly see that it corresponds well to the notes of Slendro tuning. Same thing can be done for instruments tuned to Pelloc, where we see that there is the same correlation. 
I believe we can conclude that the same objective mechanisms of relation of spectrum and tuning that gave us our scales work with gamelan. But because of different choice of instruments, it forced people of Indonesia to get to completely different set of pitches that is incompatible with Western music theory and Western instruments. The tuning masters tune gamelan like they hear, to their liking. They have control over the pitch and amplitude of some partials, and also they rely on their memory of what gamelan should sound like. So there are many contributions to the choice of exact tuning. Same thing was true in the West before standardization to 12-tone equal temperament. There was a big diversity of tunings, each with their own flavor. And composers choose certain tonalities for their pieces because different tonalities actually sounded different. However, apart from taste, there is an objective contribution to dissonance, to which tuning gravitates, as it maps places where partials of a sound coincide, and therefore notes start to harmonize with each other, and the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts. Globalization got to Indonesia and especially to Bali, where gamelan takes in influences from Western music. I think one of the influences that the West can take from gamelan is the use of unique inharmonic timbres tuned to related tunings, thus enriching the harmonic vocabulary in that way. If you like this video, you may find my video Can Octave Sound Dissonant also interesting. Many thanks to the channels from which I took videos with demonstration of gamelan instruments, as I don't have access to them myself. I'll leave links to them in the description. And special thanks to William Sitharis, that came up with the method of dissonance curves and described it in his book Tuning Timbre Spectrum Scale. That book inspires me a lot. You should check it out if you, were, if, if you want more info on that topic. It is a great read. Thank you for watching. Ask a question in comments, like, subscribe, support on Bandcamp, and until next time. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I was just, I was just like praising the video and saying that I hope uh, you know that looking at, at this aspect of uh, um, the theory that we, we covered uh, from the perspective of, of a different culture and, and how it relates to uh, non-Western tunings kind of gives this um, interesting uh, angle that um, you know what we treat the symbolic aspect of music, basically which notes are being played to the choices of what are the notes and eventually what instruments are being playing them. All of these things are kind of uh, intertwined and, and mingled. So really to create an interesting uh, novel music, you have to consider all of these aspects. Um, and, but I would say that from now, we'll mostly focus on the question of how to choose the notes rather than how to synthesize or how to understand the timbre. Uh, but, um, you know, that's kind of the acoustics and the signal processing aspect of this class uh, that puts everything in, in, in a certain perspective. Uh, what I would suggest is uh, let's take, um, no, let's take a 10 minutes break and, and um, meet uh, maybe 4.15. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just do half an hour, whatever. Actually, I promised to have some extra time for discussion. So uh, we, depending, like if anybody would like to discuss and, and, and suggest things, uh, we can devote the, the last half an hour uh, to this. If not, I can start with, with talking about, again, the tonnets and, and the theory of tonnets. Uh, we'll definitely, will not be finished with, with that part uh, this week. So we'll continue also. And next we're talking about um, uh, the representation of music on this, uh, you know, we have seen this torus, you know, this structure, the mathematical kind of representation of Western music uh, as a way to kind of give uh, a mathematical foundation for uh, ideas of uh, generating now interesting sequences in some kind of a space that actually uh, captures specific properties that we might find interesting. Um, so yeah.
So we have about 10 minutes left for the break. Um, so 4.15 uh, and we'll take it from there. We'll see. If, okay, so see you soon. And uh, yeah. And,
Okay, I didn't record the answer to the question, but I was in the recording. So uh, yeah, so after the break, uh, there was a question that I didn't record about using mu score uh, to synthesize different numbers. So I think just to, for the sake of having this on record, we'll, if we miss this. Um, um, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't record last week's class. Yeah, so I will I'll try to um, keep in mind and then please also you know, remind me if, uh, um, if I don't mention that I'm recording class, that I should do that uh, at the beginning of the class, of course, or after the break. So I almost forgot to record. Um, so what I missed between the break and, and the recording now was just mentioning that a new score, I will not reopen it. Uh, you go to the mixer um, menu and then you will have the instruments showing. And it had like a sine wave, which would be a very simple one. It had bottle, which is also relatively simple. And then if you look at pianos or you take brass instruments, and we also kind of played some notes from uh, uh, accordion, rubandeon, uh, which is kind of the Argentinian version of accordion, uh, Piazzolla music. Uh, these are these are much more complex timbres, and you can hear them by, you know, the simple ones will be a little bit like muted, or uh, in the sense of like not having higher frequent higher harmonics, um, while you know, the rich timbres you can hear kind of the, the mid range and the high range very dominantly. Uh, okay, so we continue going into the idea of uh, Western representations and autonomous spaces. Uh, and there is this whole field of mathematical music theory and people working on attempts to mathematically represent Western music. Now, uh, there's even this field of computational musicology that I will not go way beyond what we do now and maybe show some examples of uh, using, let's say, tonic spaces and random walks on these spaces uh, as, as a possible direction for uh, compositional practices. So this is kind of the, the basic uh, tonic grid. Uh, you can read more also on Wikipedia. They, they actually put this under uh, so-called neo riemannian theory. Uh, so I will not really talk so much about, you know, the Riemann theory has this idea of basic transformations. So these P, L, and R ideas kind of come from the idea of Riemann, but uh, that's historical. This is kind of slightly different approach. So let's just uh, accept this, this idea that there is this uh, musical theory by Riemann. This is kind of a more modern version. But what is, what is this kind of um, tiling uh, representation of tones. Uh, so the idea is very much like what we saw already in tonnets, so it wouldn't be so surprising. It's just kind of arranging this. Uh, so we put the, the, the notes, the names of uh, the 12-tone uh, keys, okay, uh, on this two-dimensional grid where we have basically three different lines here, okay? Anything that goes horizontally here is circle of fifth, okay, from C to G to D to A, or going this way, going to F to C, B flat to F, E flat to B, and you should kind of check if you're not kind of intuitively already familiar with these notions, you should kind of verify uh, here at some numbers, okay, um, but the idea is that uh, you actually, you know, I'm taking away my comment about the numbers because I'm, I'm not so confident what they stand for. I have to check the original article. But uh, the names, yeah, these are the notes, okay? And uh, every horizontal line is arranged according to circle first. Now we have two diagonal lines here going from, you know, let's say from left to right, top to bottom, or going uh, from right to left if you go top to bottom. So, so this diagonal line, okay, is actually uh, going through major thirds, okay? So C to E to G sharp or A flat, or C to A flat, F, uh, F flat, which becomes an E, 
So these are major thirds, okay? And these in this direction are the minor thirds, okay? So uh, of course there is a lot of redundancies, things repeat, okay? Uh, and there's also another interesting aspect of this is that uh, uh, we'll see in a second that actually if you keep on going on the circle of fifth, okay, at a certain point we, we cover all 12 notes and we end up in the same note. So uh, we can basically, and also going on these two circles, we end up eventually with the same note. And that kind of suggests that we can kind of fold this into certain geometrical structure it has a specific topology and that will be the torus that we'll see in a second but before going there what i would like to show is that you know now a lot of the basic triad structures are very localized okay they're actually represented as these triangles okay and the way this uh, tonnet grid is uh, designed you can see that you have you know the blue ones are the minor thirds so let's say uh, C, okay, E flat and G. This is the uh, minor chord based on C. So this is the C minor chord, okay? Or if you go this way, C, E, G, you know, the, the red ones that point down, these are the major chords. And then there are these transformations that the P transformation actually flips major to minor. You can see also some interesting relations between, let's say, uh, a major and its neighboring minor on the right side. Okay, so what we have here is C, E, G, G which is the C major chord moving to E, G, B. So that's kind of the, uh, the third above. Okay. Uh, we have uh, another relation here, which is C, E, G going to A, C, E. Okay. So in musical terminology, let's say C major or A minor, they're um, kind of the parallel tonalities. A minor is considered parallel, okay? Um, sorry, they're the relative. Sorry. They're the relative tonalities. The C major and the A minor are relative. C major and C minor are the parallel. And the L stands for leading tone which means it's like you take C, E, G, and you move C to B, and you end up with E, G, B. It's almost like moving a, a major third up. And so this is where the, this parallel relative and, and the leading tone come from. Uh, it's not so important what are these uh, names, what they stand for, because they refer to maybe to some, some terminology typical of music. But you can see that there is some kind of interesting geometrical proximity and relations between triads here, okay? So as we mentioned, if you wrap this, uh, you can kind of see that in this fifth minor triads and major triads, you can position the notes on some kind of a total structure and uh, um, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of research in that specific kind of musicological way Dimitri Dimochko uh, does a lot of uh, research on this kind of torus structures. Do they kind of measure or represent musical theory? So um, that kind of justifies that tonal representation. Just instead of having circles, you see that they're kind of put on the grid, okay? So I think the, the interesting applications are that you can actually, uh, use this representation to either create a controller or interface um, or um, and do even something, I wouldn't say more interesting than this. I mean, this, this is kind of fun way to learn to play music where you actually have, you know, very kind of different structures than, let's say on the piano, you need kind of to memorize every key, every tonality, there's slightly different fingerings, different sequences of black and night, uh, white and black uh, keys. On these interfaces, uh, you kind of have to relearn the way the, the course is structured. And, um, you know, some people claim that that's actually a more intuitive way to, uh, to play and, and create a keyboard, okay? Now, what does it mean for us? Well, it means that if you make some kind of a continuous walk on this space, 
uh, it's easier to actually create interesting musical sequences rather than going and trying to make some kind of a random walk on, on a piano keyboard. Uh, so let's kind of go and look at this example uh, of tons representations. Now, people were exploring not only like the, the standard tonnets representations of uh, uh, three, four, five, which is the thirds, the major, minor, and, and uh, the major's third, minor's third, and the fifth. Uh, you can also arrange this in, in different relations of intervals on, on the three axes, but let's stick to the uh, traditional one and see, uh, you know, we can kind of play. The fun part here is, we can take a song, okay, and play it. Oops. Okay, so uh, now just just kind of try it out and check check the the slides and and, and go on this website. But the idea is that uh, for a lot of you know a lot of musical examples, okay, let's say you know classical music. Yeah, a lot of the chord structures are really uh, showing as, as as patterns on on this grid. Okay. So, so the whole idea that you move from one chord to a neighboring chord and uh, change minor to major, uh, a lot of these are kind of local operations, but adding a note, moving from one try to another one. So kind of a, a local random walk seems to be a, a good way kind of to look for uh, creating these musical structures. Now, um, um, yeah, maybe an example of, of music performed on this keyboard. Let's play. Up here just because we're running out of time. So um, and next week I'll actually uh, will talk about the, or I'll, I'll play the presentation about this paper, uh, random walks and new remaining spaces with gender transformation. 
where I think this is an interesting example of how to combine the random walk uh, and the graph structure on a space that is already pre-designed to have a specific structure. Okay, so that kind of leads to this idea that you know, we'll talk about random walks uh, next week. Uh, that will be also your second assignment, you know, creating some, uh, well, in some sense, the Mozart dice game is going to be throwing two dice, creating a random uh, set of numbers and looking it up in the, in the database. So it's not exactly space. You actually create bars. Uh, so we can look at also the question of tonnets and distances between you know, the chord structures between these bars. Uh, but you know this paper, which is not, not something that will be part of the exam of the homework, uh, but it gives this idea that you create a random process that actually makes a walk in the right space. Um, and if you find the right space and find the right way of mapping your random process to musical structures, um, that mapping in some sense captures a lot of the musical structure uh, when you know the random walk is just kind of a way to compose. So, so in some sense, uh, that idea of, of representation learning and generative mechanisms is already present even in this very kind of like traditional aspects of uh, uh, music analysis theory representation uh, that have to do nothing with machine learning um, as such. So that will be kind of where we start next week. And then we'll talk about randomness, marker processes and, uh, um, and aleatoric music. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty much yeah, the end of the class. Um, well, thank you guys, and then uh, see you next week. If, if anybody has any questions, again, next week I will be still out, um, um, out of San Diego, so we'll have next week class on Zoom as well. All right, so stop sharing. Okay, well, thank you so much, and yeah, don't hesitate to send me emails or on chat. Uh, I think if you also if you post on Canvas, you should get it. Anyway, you find you know if you, if you have questions, then I see to ask. All right, thank you. Right. Bye bye. Thank you. See you. Thanks. Bye bye.